Hey, everybody. People are still joining, but I think we may as well get started now. And hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. So um, I'm Ronald from Nadra. Uh, I'm the president for Compute Ontario, uh, and I am one of your hosts for this event today. Um, before I begin, I think I would like to just acknowledge and recognize that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. I welcome all of you to the event and we're really pleased that you could join us today. So I think first up we'll just do a quick review of the agenda. Um, so in about 10 minutes or so, Thibaut Thierry uh, from SOSIP will be starting us off. Uh, and then at 1.30, we'll have the keynote address from Charles Nierbeze from the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation. Uh, around about 1.55 or so, we'll be doing a moderated question and answer session. Uh, and then we'll probably wrap things up around half past two or so. Uh, a couple of quick housekeeping notes for everybody. Um, we are going to be recording the session and we will be making it available for all attendees today. Uh, and if you can make use of the chat function for general comments and questions, uh, we'll be monitoring this and we'll ask our speakers to respond in the question and answer session at the end. And the chat function will just allow you to drop your questions in as they come up. Um, so please make use of that facility. So my role this afternoon is to give you a bit of a brief orientation to advanced computing uh, and the ecosystem that supports it in Canada. So today I'll be speaking to you mainly about an Ontario perspective, and in future sessions, you will have the opportunity to learn more about the ecosystem uh, as it sort of is really focused from the Atlantic region and also in Quebec. Uh, so we have a really diverse group of people here today. And so I thought it might be helpful just to start at the beginning um, with a quick talk about what do we mean by advanced computing. Advanced computing is a term that gets thrown around a lot. It means different people to different, uh, different things to different people. Um, so when we're talking about it today, what I'm really talking about is any kind of computing you might want to do that you couldn't do on your typical desktop or on your typical laptop. So for some folks that might mean parallel computing, or you might be talking about high performance computing or supercomputing. Um, we might be talking about big data, might be talking about data analytics, data visualization, might even just be talking about storing enormous amounts of data that you just couldn't fit on your hard drives typically. Um, often we use sort of more advanced computing for doing things like machine learning, data analytics, and artificial intelligence. And researchers tend to use these sort of powerful tools to turn raw data into knowledge breakthroughs and solve real issues that we face. Industries tend to use advanced computing for automating manufacturing, combating hacking, accelerating software development, and in mining, advanced computing is often used at things like autonomous vehicles, environmental monitoring, impact analysis, targeting drills, and or reserve forecasting. And we'll be hearing about all these other uses a little bit later today. So there's a really complex ecosystem that's involved in delivering advanced computing. Uh, and because I live in a world which has research as its primary focus, um, advanced computing is often known also as digital research infrastructure. And that's DRI, it's a term that encompasses hardware, data, data management, software, skills training, infrastructure such as high-speed networks, and also critically the people that can make all the pieces work together so that we can all leverage this technology. And this slide kind of gives a bit of a simplified view of who does what in the ecosystem. So starting on the left, funding. Um, advanced computing is expensive. Uh, and so a lot of the funding for the DRI platform in Canada, at least the national platform, comes through uh, ISED, uh, which is the Innovation Science and Economic Development Agency. Um, so they provide a lot of the funding, but then there's also significant funding that's provided by provincial matching contributions and also by some institutions as well. So it's a federated funding model, which reflects the federated nature of the ecosystem. In terms of strategy, investment and coordination, because it is a federation, a lot of effort is required for actually coordinating all the events. Uh, so a lot of this work is done by an organization known as the Digital Research Alliance of Canada. And there are also regional organizations across the country as well. Uh, so starting from the east, we have ACENET, and then we have Calcul Quebec in Quebec, Compute Ontario uh, for Ontario, and everything west of Ontario is currently served by an organization that's known as Westgrid. In terms of how you access services, uh, there are a lot of individual academic institutions and academic consortia that provide uh, the computational power and the expertise to researchers, and this gets uh, coordinated through the national DRI platform. 
There are also some mixed consortia which comprise both industry and academic members, and they provide computing empower and expertise to industry and also link that industry with the academic experts. So examples of these organizations would be SOSIP, ACENET, and PINK. Uh, the ecosystem also includes research institutes, we have university and college libraries, and lots of enabling services such as high-speed networks as well. And there's a lot of collaboration amongst academic researchers and industry, uh, including in the oiling oil, gas, and mining sectors. And several of the regional agencies and the consortia that are on this slide are actually going to be your co-hosts for today. And you'll have the chance to chat with many of them. So each of our organizations has a slightly different business model and a slightly different mandate, but all of us support research and innovation in some sort of fashion. And we all have a strong interest in supporting the mining sector in Canada. And we felt like this event would be we'd have a much bigger impact by partnering for this set of workshops and then opening up to the whole country rather than working individually in our respective regions. And so COVID, you know, for all of the chaos that it's brought, has really helped us to embrace the spirit of virtual meetings. And so by leveraging sort of what we've learned over the last little while at running these kind of events, we thought that we could have a much more powerful and hopefully a much more useful event, which will get some really interesting conversations started here today. Um, so just very briefly, you know, Compute Ontario, we're funded in Ontario by the Ministry of Colleges and Universities, and our role is to kind of really deal with strategy and bringing together uh, provincial and federal investments for Ontario's DRI ecosystem. ACENET supports Atlantic Canada, uh, and they have, uh, they provide infrastructure and also a team of uh, research experts uh, that can really support uh, training and delivery of ARC systems uh, to academic, government, and industry users. Calcul Quebec does a similar sort of function within Quebec. Uh, and in Quebec, we also have PINK, uh, which is focused on digital innovation uh, through collaboration between academia and industry. And SOSIP plays a similar function, bridging the academy and industry in Ontario as well. Uh, and I should note that we have Michelle Fash uh, from ACENET and Eric Capel from PINK. Uh, as part of the audience today, and they would be delighted to answer questions and talk further about what they do. So if you're in Atlantic Canada or Quebec, don't hesitate to reach out to them. And of course, in Ontario, we have Tibor who will be talking to you in just a second. And we will provide you with some contact information for everybody as well. And speaking of Tibor, I think I will now hand over to, to you. Um, so Tibor Thierry is the Executive Director of SOSIP, and he'll tell you a little bit more about the work that SOSIP does and how advanced computing fits into the way that we're thinking about industry and academic collaboration. Tibor brings a lot of experience with uh, academic research, industry, and global R&D, um, and is really sort of focused on the innovation side of things. Um, Tibor, over to you. Thank you very much, Ranald. Thanks for the, um, the initial presentation and uh, for handing off the mic. I have the, the benefit of seeing each other face to face. Um, so thank you very much for those um, for participating in those two. Right now, I'd like to uh, give a presentation a bit about uh, SOSIP. Uh, I was mentioned earlier a little bit about about SOSIP, but I want to give you a bit more in depth uh, cross section of who we are. So SOSIP was launched uh, way back ten years ago. We're, in a, we're celebrating our tenth anniversary this year. Uh, it was a collaboration between uh, Ontario academic institutions, FedDev, IBM Canada and um, SMEs across uh, the province. So the idea was and still is uh, to bring together academic and industry expertise all about addressing um, uh, the innovation gap in Canada and specifically um, giving SMEs access to the right technology and the right expertise in order to, um, to address various real world problems. So uh, SOSIP has, uh, in the time we've been around, we've established a collaborative ecosystem, um, helping to accelerate economic impact, job creation, and skills retention. So these, this is the real reason um, uh, that SOSIP was put together, that, that last bullet there. Uh, next slide. So our mission, um, still as relevant today as it was on day one, is to bring together these industrial partners, uh, big and small, um, and academic research researchers, the experts, uh, provide them with uh, sophisticated advanced computing technologies and expertise to solve the social, technical, and business challenges across sectors. And uh, the intent here is to drive economic growth. So this mission is founded on the belief that data science, education, training, and research 
uh, can and does improve the way Canadians live and work. And I believe that's more than borne out by um, much data. Next. Okay, let's talk about uh, what we do. Uh, so we are Canada's leading uh, research consortium bringing advanced computing directly to industry and to companies uh, uh, who need them, who want to adopt them. And we build these partnerships um, in-house with our own uh, business development partnership function, industry and academic partners alike, uh, to solve industry challenges. We're not here as an academic uh, support, we're here as an industry support uh, to align tools and funding and to ensure the success of whatever projects we, we take on to our, our resources and our systems. Next. And the outcomes, um, there's five principal pillars of outcomes, uh, commercializing new products, services, improving business processes, increasing sales at companies, uh, creating new jobs at those companies and uh, taking advantage of, advantage of the talent, uh, helping to train that talent and ultimately growing companies uh, the ultimate holy grail being uh, uh, export and um, and scaling up of, of those companies. Next. So here's a couple of perspectives of uh, what we do when we look at uh, a bit of the nuts and bolts. So we support all the components of a successful industry driven research collaboration, whether it's uh, the, the co actual computing technology itself, uh, the software and the tools that you need, the technology experts that you that you may need. Um, we also provide uh, partnership support um, and um, access to HQP and uh, connections to funding and uh, commercialization ultimately at the end. Next. We go to the next slide. Yep. So the second perspective has to do with uh, driving industrial growth. So from this industrial perspective, uh, we're all about um, uh, supporting industry, develop new product services, improving their business processes, solving problems that they may have, uh, creating the jobs uh, that you need now and, and into the future uh, in your organization, bringing Canadian products and uh, services that you have to market and ultimately to share the results. Yes, indeed. Okay, I'd like to touch on uh, advanced computing once more again, uh, as there's a lot of jargon in this in this sector and uh, can get very confusing, especially uh, for the debutante. Um, uh, let's let's try to boil this down and talk about what advanced computing is as an umbrella term and what we mean by advanced computing. So much, it, basically, it's much more than your laptop, uh, whatever your laptop can do and, and the and the uh, programs and the uh, the apps you may have. This is beyond that, well beyond that. So it's a combination of computer hardware, the actual equipment, and also how you use it. So here's uh, just a short list of some of the um, some of the terminology that uh, may also apply that may be included under advanced computing. So everybody's heard of supercomputers. So supercomputing itself um, uh, uh, can be referred to as uh, high performance computing, HPC. Uh, there's machine learning, artificial intelligence, data visualization, visualizing uh, large amounts of data, representing it in ways we can understand. Of course, there's big data, massive amounts of information, and data mining, how we look at that information, something that uh, was up until now impossible to really see uh, without the help of, uh, of advanced computing. Um, uh, cloud analytics, data analytics, uh, deep learning, uh, virtual twinning as a concept to bring into the digital world something that lies outside of it. Uh, natural language processing is uh, gaining ground. Uh, smart computing and on and on. We could talk about all these jargons, but ultimately advanced computing is an umbre umbrella term where you can have access to uh, any one of those that may fit your particular need. Okay. So why do we need it? Now that we know what it is, uh, let's boil it down to four simple areas. So first, the problems that you have and that you're trying to solve are just too big. So you need more memory than your regular laptop laptop can handle uh, significantly more memory to, to solve some some kinds of problems. Uh, the data is too big, especially in big data problems. You need more storage. You just can't um, you can't put the data someplace where you can manage it and manipulate it and work with it. So the data is too big. You need more storage. Uh, problems take too long. You need faster results. Uh, 
or that the problems are just simply so complex that you need more and faster computations. Uh, if you have a need in one or more of those, you are a candidate for advanced computing. Next. SOSIP itself, uh, we do have our own facilities, our own hardware. We have three different platforms, the cloud analytics platform, uh, Canada's only dedicated cloud analytics uh, platform uh, for industry applications and use. Um, we also have as our crown jewel, our CPU accelerated platform where we do deep learning and simulations of all different kinds. Also parallel CPU platform, a more traditional kind of, um, of uh, uh, CPU technology, but uh, nonetheless uh, very good for doing many different types of, uh, of uh, problem solving and computation. Those are our three platforms. And what do you put on those platforms? Well, you, you do project work and the project development looks something like this at SOSIP. When you look at uh, the partnership services we provide off the top, uh, on the one hand, you may have uh, an industry partner or partners, an SME, a startup, multinational, whatever it may be, uh, one or more of them with a specific defined challenge, and that's critical. Uh, with a, along with a contribution comes along and on the right side I have academic partner or partners or post-secondary partners if you happen to be working with a college with the expertise and talent that's needed in order to uh, engage with the project. You bring those those together with uh, leveraged uh, funding from uh, existing organizations uh, perhaps outside like uh, MyTax, like NSERC, OCI. Uh, like Scale AI, various other uh, sources of funding uh, to inject into the project. Um, and then SOSIP can provide advanced computing resources and technical support in order to engage with approved projects uh, to provide and generate um, positive outcomes and, and trained highly qualified personnel out on the other side, often uh, capable of being hired uh, by the same organizations, and that's uh, one of the one of the great outcomes we have at SOSIP. That's what the project development cycle looks like. Next, our SOSIP community uh, looks something like this. We have um, ecosystem partners, uh, some of which are funders, but uh, they include government. They include partners um, uh, uh, that uh, are are listed here. Of course, there's there we do have other partners as well, but this gives you an idea of of where we play. Um, and of course, we have our all important uh, members. Uh, we have institutional members, 18 of them, uh, universities and now five different colleges, as well as industry members, Cornerstone Partner IBM, the first one. Uh, to that, we've added uh, Loblaw Companies Limited, Unilever Canada, and uh, Nuclear Innovation Institute and DARE, uh, which is the Downsview Aerospace Innovation and Research Hub. Uh, both of which come with uh, a, a cohort of their own companies. So that's what the community looks like at the moment. And um, next slide. Our impact, what has all this produced? Well, um, uh, quite a bit actually. So, so far, uh, so, so we've engaged over 170 different companies uh, in collaborative R&D projects, 73% of the, of the uh, projects involved uh, small to medium sized enterprises. We do work with companies of any size, gargantuan down to uh, uh, single person startups, um, but that's a quite, quite a large fraction are, are small to medium size. Um, and we have uh, helped to deploy the next generation talent, uh, more than 1,057 and counting, um, have, have gained skills and experience uh, being involved with SOSIP projects. More than 552 uh, industrial personnel have also been involved along with those, um, those HQP. Uh, we're also building an ecosystem um, with over 290 collaborative um, R&D projects and $140 million, $43 million have been leveraged in R&D investments uh, in those projects as well. Next. So let's shift gears a little bit and uh, start talking a little bit about uh, mining, mining innovation and, and uh, how AI, for example, can transform mining innovation. So I have some suggestions, uh, perhaps some, um, some perspective um, 
candidates where where there might be top areas for AI uh, leaning in and uh, transforming mining today. Uh, so um, uh, first of these is optimizing, optimizing operational performance or supply chain, anything, anything to do with uh, uh, operating the mine in a more efficient way, gaining more revenue, uh, uh, making things run more smoothly uh, in ways that, in multi-dimensional ways that uh, a human operator, a human mine manager uh, might find challenging is something that AI can definitely help with. Um, another area is reducing energy consumption and GHG emissions. Uh, this is, of course, uh, top of mind uh, these days and will become uh, more, more and more important in the future. Um, how to use the energy um, more efficiently, how to reduce those uh, GHG emissions. In order to do these things, you need to have a, a really in-depth understanding of, of the operations in the mine. Um, third, wearable technologies and, uh, and Internet of Things, uh, knowing where equipment is, where people are, uh, what they're doing, um, and uh, making sure that safety is a factor at all times in real time. Uh, this is very important in wearable technologies and something that AI can help with. And also uh, human-centered, smart and autonomous mind design. It's, it's, a, it's a, bit of, um, uh, a, a bit of a head shaker, but it's true uh, for all this computing that, that we may be wanting to insert into mining. Uh, it becomes more human-centered if you do it right and it makes it a, a better place to work. It makes it... Um, uh, safer. It makes it uh, easier. Uh, so being human-centered um, uh, is one of the great features that AI can bring, uh, provided it's, it's designed in the right way. Uh, it becomes a better experience for users and for, and for everyone. Okay. I believe we've been kicked out. And, uh, or have we? Let's see. Okay. Thank you very much. Seems that we're back on track. Uh, and of course, finally, attracting and, um, and developing and, re and retaining talent. This is very important in the future of mining, making sure that uh, these highly qualified um, uh, people, the next generation of uh, mining innovators uh, is brought in, is, uh, is developed and is retained. That's, that's an extremely important part and something that AI can also help it with as well. And to the next slide, please. Okay, and just to wrap up, um, looking at the time, uh, we should move on. I wanted to uh, just highlight a few different examples of uh, innovation realized where um, SOSIP projects have led to some, uh, some positive success stories. Uh, here's one example uh, with uh, PBE Canada. Uh, this project was all about fusion and analysis of multi-sensor minor data and this was using smart computing uh, platforms so the challenge here is to develop a platform that that combines the data from digital wireless radio thermal and video imaging in real time basically to keep track of um, um, the uh, location of miners where the explosives are um, where the vehicles in, in mines are uh, continuously. Uh, and this is something that can be done in, in real time, which was a, a very innovative and um, helpful tool for, for the mining manager in order to help uh, him or her operate. Um, and this was done um, with, uh, with a couple of different, two different platforms. It's not uncommon to use uh, the platforms that are, that are most well suited to uh, whatever it is that you happen to be doing, uh, calculating or, or trying to attain. Uh, so this one used two different platforms, the, uh, the cloud and our GPU. Um, and um, the, the result, the outcome here was uh, the, the, the PBE Mine Boss um, 2.0 Mine Wide Tracking System and a Proximity Alert System, uh, which, which was successfully uh, the result of, of this work. Uh, on to the next, next example, uh, together with our uh, cornerstone partner, IBM Canada, uh, this particular project looked, looked at uh, simulating climate change impacts on permafrost systems. Uh, you can imagine uh, how the changing, melting permafrost uh, can wreak havoc with various types of logistics operations. 
that's this is a very important thing to understand and the capabilities um, to um, to know what's going on in the field, uh, particularly where those act activities are taking place is, is quite important. And some good outcomes were achieved uh, uh, together uh, in this particular project. Next. Um, here's uh, another innovation realized. This one's Drone Delivery Canada, uh, which at first glance you might scratch your head and say, what does this have to do with mining? Well, it happens to be a lot because drone and drones are being used in many different things uh, from prospecting on down. Uh, so uh, how does this drone, where there's no roads, where there's no aspect, a sense of uh, where it is located, uh, how do you get this drone to navigate? So this particular project looked at visual breadcrumbs for emergency return for unmanned aerial vehicles. The, these are valuable resources and uh, given weather and various things uh, as you're using them, it's good to be able to track them uh, back to home base. And that was the purpose of this particular project. Uh, it's obviously useful in any environment, be it urban, but certainly has uh, special and um, and uh, valued applications in mining. Next. A Cisco Mining Corporation, um, they did a fusion and analysis of multi-sensor miner data using smart computing platforms. So the challenge here was to use cloud computing to automate, represent, and analyze data sets to improve geologists' work and reduce the time and cost of compiling um, uh, GIS maps, which is uh, clearly quite important. And we had some good results come out, uh, good outcomes come out from this uh, particular project as well, um, including uh, Java implementation of hill shades and canny edge detect and al algorithm um, in, in this particular case, uh, shuttle radar topography mission data. Okay. I think that's that's all. Uh, if you do have information or do have interest in uh, contacting SOSIP, uh, want further information on, on how you might uh, use our advanced computing resources, or you want to explore ways that you can um, work together with uh, a, a partner and um, perhaps realize some of the uh, good outcomes of your own, uh, please do give us a call, or rather I should say, please apply at SOSIP.org. Okay. Thanks for your attention. I hope that was um, was of some use and of uh, some interest to, to everybody. Uh, now I'd like to um, go ahead and introduce uh, Charles Nibesi. Uh, Charles is the Vice President of Business Development and Commercialization at the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation, or SEMI. I almost never say the, the, the full version of that. It's always just SEMI, SEMI. So Charles, uh, beyond his uh, charismatic uh, persona and uh, you know infamous uh, you know um, reputation uh, in mining and, and elsewhere, uh, Charles leads uh, Semi's Commercialization Support Services division and is responsible for the identification and securing uh, of opportunities to help clients close the commercialization gap associated with introducing new technologies into the mining value stream. He's also involved with Canada's Mining Innovation Commercialization Accelerator, or MICA network, which has just announced its pan-Canadian call for proposals. So I thought I'd just kind of put a plug in there for you, uh, Charles, uh, before you give our presentation. Can I invite you to do your presentation now, our keynote? Okay, thank you, Thibault. I'm just gonna share my screen. Right. Okay, uh, Thibault, maybe just do a sound check. Can you hear me okay? Can you see my screen? All good, Charles. Looks good. Excellent. Thank you. Again, thank you, Thibault, for uh, inviting me to speak. And I just want to say bonjour, everybody uh, across Canada. I'm so glad to be able to share with you some uh, thoughts on, uh, on our industry and how we can make that connection between mining and advanced computing uh, become more apparent, kind of just flush it out so that everybody can see it more clearly. But before I jump into the presentation, I want to acknowledge where I am. I am in Robinson Huron Treaty territory, and the land on which I am in right now is the traditional territory of the Atikmashang Anishinaabeg. What I want to do is start off by sort of enrolling you into a conversation. Look, I am totally biased in that uh, I love mining, 
So, so everything I say about mining comes from that kind of viewpoint of somebody who's totally sold out uh, to mining. The world as we know it right now depends on mining. I think all you need to do is look around you and sort of make that acknowledgement. Not only is the world dependent on mining today, but it is a generational dependency. And I have sort of looked at mining now as an existential resource. You know how people talk about climate change as an existential threat? Well, mining is that existential resource that we need. We cannot live without it. So we all have phones, we've got computers, we've got lights, cables, electricity, et cetera, and all these are brought to us courtesy of mining. There's never been a time in history when there has been so much demand for technology, minerals, and metals as we have right now. So things like copper, which is supposed to double in demand for copper, lithium, cobalt, and nickel. Mining is a primary industry. And I like to say to people that, um, again, totally biased, the mining is the god of all industries, that all the industries sort of depend on mining. But I will acknowledge though that advanced computing is something that we all need. Without advanced computing, we would all would not be able to be speaking together right now. So kudos to advanced computing as well. Mining is a multidisciplinary business system. It's a multidisciplinary industry system as well. Mining is no longer just about mining. The demands of the low carbon economy are causing us all to think about sustainability in different ways. And mining needs to do what it does in a cleaner way. There's a surge of clean technologies out there that can all support mining. We all know that when you truly calculate the true cost of, say, carbon on, a, on any product, you will see that when you roll all the way back to where the mining, the resources are coming from, that we must responsibly source these inputs that are going to create the future that we're all looking for. Canada and the UN, United States have recently coined, uh, made a list of minerals and metals that they're calling critical minerals. The world is resource hungry for minerals and metals. This is why we've got those critical minerals. There's a large portion of this world who don't have what we have, right? They don't have the fridges and the stoves and the toys and the gadgets, the ATVs, snowmobiles, etc. They want these things as well. And the only way they're going to get all these things is that if we produce more minerals and metals. So you may be wondering, well, what does all this have to do with advanced computing? Beginning with the end in mind, here's what we want to do. I would like to connect the resources, capabilities, and assets and opportunities in advanced computing with what's happening with the mining value creation ecosystem. So the mining value creation ecosystem, if you think about it end to end, it's not just that hole in the ground that is mining. Mining is a whole entire process, starting all the way from prospecting, exploration, all the way to rehabilitation and repurposing. So what I'm going to do is I want to connect the dots between these components of mining and advanced computing. And hopefully by the end of our presentation, some people, most of us can walk away with that aha moment of seeing where those connections are. But before I jump into connecting the mining value creation ecosystem to advanced computing, I want to start off by introducing you to Semi and to Micah. So let's talk about Semi. Semi, 14 year old organization, will be 15 years old in, uh, in May. Uh, we are a teenager and uh, we're not for profit organization governed by board of directors. We are in Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, Sudbury happens to be one of those places on the planet where mining is on everyone's tip of every, everyone's tongue and underneath most people's houses. The vision for MICA, for SEMI, sorry, not MICA, I'll get to MICA in a moment, for SEMI, is to solve the challenges of the mining industry by making the future happen tomorrow. I like to say, make the future happen today. The mission for SEMI is to advance innovation that will help the mining industry to positively impact its triple bottom line. SEMI has structured itself into sort of four core services, innovation scouting, challenge identification, challenge solution matching, and commercialization services. Under commercialization services, we are aiming to close the commercialization gap, an area that I coin as the commercialization value of death, a place where good ideas literally go to die. So MICA was created to close that commercialization gap. So let's talk about MICA. So MICA has six main partners across the country, and I'll get back to that in a second. We did launch MICA in November of 2021. It's a five-year program. It's a national network. 
headquartered in Sudbury with six main partners, which are Brim in British Columbia, Inotech in Alberta, Saskatchewan Polytechnic in Saskatchewan, of course, Mars and Semi are sort of looking at the dog of Ontario, Misa in Quebec, and the College of North Atlantic in Northumland, also covering New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. The territories, Yukon and the Nunavut, are being addressed by those provinces that touch them. Mike has a membership model open to SMEs, mining companies, others, institutions. We were funded by the government $40 million by uh, the Department of ICED. Thank you to the government of Canada. This funding we will leverage to $112 million through projects. Great news. We recently launched our first call for proposals and it's open right now. Uh, and it will be closing March the 7th. So go on our website and uh, see if there's something there for you. MICA has three core service areas or three core activities that we'll be doing. Number one, we'll be offering commercial support services. Number two, network development activities and technical projects. Let's talk about technical projects. Under technical projects, we're looking at them under four different four te technology themes. Productivity, we were looking at increasing mine productive capacity at lower costs. We're looking at energy reduction and energy consumption, making sure that we are using energy in the most efficient way possible with the second uh, theme. And then the, the third theme is smart digital autonomous digital mining systems. We're looking to make mining as smart as humanly possible. We need advanced computing for that. The last technology focused area is environment. We were looking to reduce the environmental risk and long term liabilities associated with, of course, mining. Talk about the mining value creation ecosystem. So MICA, with its productivity, energy, smart environment, is looking to advance technologies that will impact mining in these areas that we're calling that I'm calling the mining value creation ecosystem. So again, you can see that from mine financing all the way to rehabilitation and repurposing, there's all these different boxes. So what we're going to do now is touch on each of these boxes and sort of give you a bit of a flavor of what's truly happening in these areas. Remember what I said earlier, mining is not just a hole in the ground. Mining is such a complex system a bis of, of businesses that are systems that are integrated to create what we call the mining industry. So about financing and evaluation. Look, mining needs money for mining to do anything that it does. And this mining needs to be raised. This money needs to be raised from the investment community. So some of the activities that are happening to secure those, that financing is looking at those exploration results, looking at environmental impact, sustainable mining. And I do have other things on the list that I'm not going to touch on, but certainly you can see there's a connection with advanced computing when it comes to things like financial computing, financial models, financial risk modeling, et cetera. Let's jump on to prospecting and exploration. By the way, Canada happens to be a global center for mine finance so there's so many exploration companies that are listed, not only on the Toronto Stock Exchange, but also in British Columbia. Under the exploration um, area, the drill results are important. The geology is important. Commodity prices is important, market demands, and all this information needs to be correlated to give the best results possible. Mining produces a lot of data. This data can be converted into useful information by taking advantage of these advanced computing resources. Things like resource modeling, resource targeting, resource estimation, mapping, etc., come into play. Jump onto permitting and consultation. We need permission in order to open minds. And that permission is driven by information. Information that needs to be accurate, timely, and trusted information. So we are looking at activities like environmental impact, exploration permits, mining permits, building permits, et cetera. There's even an instrument called 43101, which is a very common instrument in mining. And again, if you look at advanced computing resources, we look at those impact modeling type uh, and also trust when you get the blockchain working, those digital certificates working, risk management has to be done. But again, there's so much information flowing that we need advanced computing resources to make this information flow. Another area is mine design, because mines need to be designed before they get constructed. So under the design side, there's infrastructure requirements, mine plant facilities being built. And again, there's a lot of information that is moving in the design stage. Things like digital twinning, design simulations come into play. Look at mine construction. And mine construction, I'm looking more so at building the infrastructure around the mine, not the mine itself, just the infrastructure around the mine. 
So there's a lot of logistics considerations, supply chain resources, building of the mine plant and facilities, all this needs to take into consideration. But again, you can see that there's an advanced computing resource that can come into play here. I'll take a moment here just to say one, one quick statement. If you follow the data, all the way from exploration to mine closure, you can actually follow the data all the way along. So the information that you gather during the exploration and permitting phases, all that information comes to play in mine construction. So the information keeps flowing and keeps building up in volume. Let's talk about mine development. Another mine development, I'm talking about building the actual infrastructure of the mine itself, not the support infrastructure. Here is where that hole in the ground comes in, when you sink a shaft to be able to access where the ore bodies are. Tunnel de development, drift development has to happen. Things like open pit construction happen and a bunch of other constructions need to happen in the mine itself. And again, things like digital twinning, digital simulations and modelings need to come into play. And in this area, things like looking at the condition monitoring of the equipment that you're using needs to start to, start to happen. Look at mining operations. And the reason why I put mining operations is I want to talk about the people. You have to hire people. You have to link the right people with the operation. There needs to be training. Health and safety comes into, 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 into play. Just talk about safety for a moment. I recently heard from one of my um, uh, one of the vendors that I, I talked to that um, there's days of the weeks where most accidents happen in a mine. It's even correlations with the full moon on when people get have most accidents. All these correlations are being made through advanced computing resources being employed into mining. Things like shift scheduling come into play, and things like support info, extension of utilities, communications infrastructure, all these things come into play as you're putting that operations piece together. Next, we talk about mineral extraction. This is what I call, I think most people call mining, right? People call mining the process of kind of taking that rock out of the ground and kind of having it, right? That's people call that mining, but really it's just the mineral extraction, extraction piece of mining. And again, here is where you get that drilling, that cutting, the blasting, the material movement, things like material sorting are happening, surveying. There's a lot of activities happening in here, and I mean, the list can go on. But there are advanced computing resources that can be correlated to these areas in things like systems analysis, design simulations, things like predictive maintenance and condition monitoring of equipment come in. Edge computing is coming in as, as, as something that is very useful for mining as we move into what's autonomous mining or automated mining. Next, let's look at mineral processing. So mineral processing is that whole process of benefication when you're actually loosing that mineral or metal out of that host rock. In this area, it is probably the area where most of the energy is being spent in the mining industry. And in this area, you've got things like the secondary crushing, the grinding mills, the mineral liberation, smelting, furnaces, leaching, flotation. There's all this work being done to extract that metal or mineral out of, out of, out of, out of its host rock. And in this area, there's advanced computing resources that touch on things like process controls, simulations, condition monitoring, predictive maintenance again comes in, digital twinning comes in, keeps coming up things like chemical analysis and more, the list can go on. You know, one of the things I was talking to Thibault about is that maybe we should even have a session where we specifically drill down and ask that hard question. Where exactly in mining can some of the advanced computing resources be, be employed by doing things like maybe we can do focus groups, working groups to really, really drill down and figure it out. Let's talk about reject materials. So why did I call them reject materials? Well, the word tailings and waste seems to underplay the true value of those reject materials. Let's call them residue materials because that's not really they are. They are kind of the byproduct, the byproduct of, of mining. These byproducts of mining need to be stored in a permanent way sometimes, but they can also be reprocessed and they can be repurposed as well. There's a lot of monitoring happening as well when you look at those reject material storage sites. But what we do want to say that is that advanced computing has been helping and is going to help more and more in creating things like early warning systems, things like digital twinning, impact modeling, even you know, like the weather modeling comes into, into play as well in this area. Risk management is another one as well because we don't want those accidents that have happened in the past to happen again in any way. Next, let's talk about um, mine closure. So you know that a mine has a life. You know, most mines have a well, all mines have a beginning and an end. Unless if you're like running a salt mine or a potash mine, those can last for hundreds of years. Uh, but most mines have a, you know, a, a mine life that can be 20 years, 10 years, or even less. Under the mine closure activities, there's remote monitoring happening. 
water monitoring and management. Those reject materials that I spoke about, some of them are permanently stored, so they may need continuous monitoring to make sure that they're staying where they're supposed to, to where, where we want them to, to, to stay and not you know, move into the environment. And again, if you look at the advanced computing resources that are attached to mine closure, you've got those things like environmental modeling, the impact modeling, tracking systems, and risk management. The last area I want to look at under the mining value creation ecosystem before I touch on some benefits is rehabilitation and repurposing. And again, in this area is when the mine is closed, what do we do with the next, right? We want to clean up the area, plant trees, reintroduction of species, permanent monitoring. But I also want to touch on some of those repurposing of mining uh, uh, assets, such as, for example, energy storage in those tunnels underground, greenhouses underground in more secure locations for sensitive growth. And things like using those open pit mines for artificial lakes that can be used for fishing if they're done right. They can also be a tourist attraction. I think the folks over in Timmins are actually looking at using some of their open pit mines as tourist attractions. Those reject uh, um, storage sites can also be used, can, can be covered by solar panels. Old mines can be used as test beds for research. They can be used uh, as place for demonstration projects. And again, that really opens up a plethora of advanced computing resources once we start to repurpose those mine sites. But we do see things like environmental impact modeling happening and where energy is being used or stored or being created in, on those old mine sites, things like energy management, management systems come into play in this area. So it's a couple of conclusions. I think I've got about three slides for conclusions. So the first slide is this. Where are the opportunities in mining for advanced computing when you look at the mining value creation ecosystem which is the whole of mining beyond that hole in the ground sort of thinking that's out there right we got to change the mindset on how we think about mining change the image of mining so here's some of the opportunities mining produces good data right it produces lots of structured data and i think we all like to work with data that is structured probably a little bit easier to work with mining is systems oriented it's a connected system Mining is process oriented, kind of lends itself to kind of automation and to further analysis and to optimization. Mining is connected systems and to end connectivity. Mining needs process and whole system optimization. And mining needs sound decision support systems that are knowledge based, that are evidence based, because you cannot afford to make the wrong decisions in mining because people's lives and assets are in, 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 at risk. Mining is getting more and more connected. And in fact, there's a lot more faces that are being put on, on a lot of this mining equipment and tools, putting a digital face to them. Sensors, there's so much sensors that are being infused into mining. So every year that goes by, I just see the mines creating more and more data. However, mining is not getting enough value from existing data. This is why we need your help, those of you in the advanced community. community. Necessary skills. Mining does not currently have the necessary skills to take full advantage of the advanced computing resources that are out there in order to really put efficiencies into this mining value creation ecosystem. We're going to need data scientists, data engineers, we're going to need analysts, software engineers and programmers, developers. We're going to need process engineers, we need systems engineering, and also we're going to need people with those specific machine learning expertise that we can bring into the mining sector. And this is going to be my second last slide. Talk about the mining of the future. Again, the mining of the future is going to be transformation of that entire mining value creation ecosystem. Mining is not just that hole in the ground. It is more, right? It is all the way from financing to rehabilitation and repurposing. And there's so many things happening across this entire system. In fact, each of these boxes in green is it in itself its own ecosystem of activity. So what do we see in the mind of the future? Less people in unsafe work. Predictive maintenance is going to be a norm in mining. Already is, it's starting to happen, although just a few of the elite companies are using it. Improved reliability. Mining has been sort of said that it's too variable, so we're going to make it more reliable. We want to have things like real-time environmental monitoring, machine-to-machine, machine-to-machine enabled automated and autonomous vehicles. We want to have that infield drill hole targeting real-time or reserve forecasting and modeling, and quantum sensors are coming in as a new thing as well. Don't know a lot about it, but I do know that accuracy of information is going to increase with quantum, quantum sensors. Edge computing is starting to happen because we can't afford to deploy an airbag using, you know, with the latency that's there, you need that information now. 
We're going to look at looking at integrated production models and simulations. Real time process optimization is starting to happen and we need more of it to happen. And digitally enabled and responsive personal protective equipment is important. So the clothes that people wear, the helmet that they wear, the boots that they wear, all this needs to be digitally enabled and digitally connected. The last thing I want to mention is that mining is moving towards what we call selective surgical mining. And I'm borrowing this from my, my friends at Nova Mera, okay, because they have, they've got that technology that is going to be surgically extract resources in a way that has never been done before. So I thank you all for listening to my presentation. But before I pan out and ask Tibo to come back, I want to remind you that MICA has its first call for proposals open right now, and uh, the closing date is March the 7th. So I don't want anyone out there to, to miss that date. It's an important date. So Tibo, I'm going to end my sharing and hand it back to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Charles, for that uh, excellent presentation. Um, we appreciate uh, the kind of the perspective that you brought and uh, kind of the various um, angles uh, of, uh, of the mining uh, sector, the, qu the questions that, that we might have. Speaking of questions, uh, don't, don't go anywhere, Charles, because uh, now we're entering our Q&A session where we uh, open up the, uh, the, the chat box, as it were, to various questions uh, from, from our participants. Hopefully, um, many of them have had a chance to consider what else they want to uh, ask of you or, or what, uh, what kind of uh, um, queries they, they might uh, get some insight with. So uh, I think the, the format we're going to be using is uh, raising your hand, um, which is also available to you on the control bar. So please, uh, rate, we're going to try to do this. So raise your hand if you have um, a question or put it in the chat. Uh, it's your choice. If you raise your hand, uh, we may ask you to ask your question. Uh, please keep it brief is the main thing that we ask. Get to the point uh, of what it is that you want to say. Uh, what you want um, Charles to address, and then we can uh, we can kind of go from there. And as as the people are, uh, as our attendees are are considering what uh, what question to to ask you, uh, per perhaps you know as we've been talking, we can kind of get the conversation started um, as the questions begin to come in. Uh, Charles, can you give us uh, an idea what 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 do you think are the pain points um, or, or the areas you think uh, that that need to be solved? these pain points with advanced computing in order for for there to be better adoption. What's what's your uh, what's your feeling on that? Yeah, great question. I, I think, you know, the mining industry is honestly on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a rapid um, um, making rapid progress in terms of, of connecting what I call the unconnected. And I, and I think, you know, by, by connecting the unconnected, what the mining industry is effectively doing is providing the information that is required to 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 then you know give over to the advanced computing uh, industry so that they can do the analysis and, and and the crunching of that information and come back with, with insights. So I think where the opportunity is there is that you know as as as, as the mining industry gets more, more connected and that is the challenge. The challenge is getting connected, getting everything connected, putting in the communications infrastructure into the industry so that the, the connectedness is there. Um, now it is happening. It is happening. It's accelerating. Uh, but I think where the missing link right now is what to do with all those mounds of information, right? There's just mm. so much data being collected and, and we need to find a way to, to be able to channel that data to access the advanced computing resources and make things work. Now, I must say, you know, with uh, the cloud computing coming up, uh, with more cloud computing happening, uh, you don't necessarily need to have a lot of those resources on site. So companies tend to reach out. Um, a long time ago, there was a lot of lack of trust of, um, uh, from the mining industry of people that handle their data outside of the industry. But you know, with blockchain technologies and sort of with more security, uh, the mining companies are feeling a lot more secured and they, they're getting a lot more um, uh, confident in, 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 in that their data won't be, won't be compromised. So there is that trust that's being built as well. So there's a lot of technologies that are working together that are making the industry become more, more responsive to want to sort of access those external resources, such as some of those advanced computing resources that may not, may not be on site. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting you um, you seem to imply that there's a, a there's a great deal of information there already uh, what what state do you think is the uh, the level of digitization if you were if, if you will of uh, in the mining sector is is there is there enough kind of data being brought in or do we do we still have to yeah, up our game and, and gather more data in the first place what's your sense yeah I think there's a lot of data being collected 
and mm -hmm. being kept. Uh, and I think historically, I mean, I recently heard that IBM did a big study in Australia, you know, where they looked at data for the last 80 years, the exploration data for the last 80 years, and they were able to use this data to really find out some great insights, you know, on where maybe, you know, there should be more better targeting of, of, of drills for uh, the exploration side. So, so the data is there, but it just needs to sort of start to get looked at in a more meaningful way. And there may be some opportunity for the mining industry to, to get maybe a, um, more knowledge on how to actually collect that data and store it in a way that will enable it to be more ready for advanced computing. So maybe the, the way the data gets collected, the way it gets structured when in the collection, there may be a need to help in that area. Uh, but certainly there are companies that are, are, are on the leading edge when it comes to using using, using data, especially mm -hmm. the, the the bigger mining companies, mm -hmm. you know, so those tier one operators, they already have a lot of um, resources internally, but you know, the majority of the mining companies are not tier one companies, right? They're sort of those mid, mid, mid sized mining operator operators. And those mining operators don't have as many resources. They don't have as many innovation resources, as many R&D resources. So I think, you know, organizations like, like SOSIP and, and the partners are going to be able to play a role in providing these, these mining, mid sized mining companies with a resource that they would otherwise not be able to afford to get, uh, you know, if it, had it been that you're not around. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, Charles, we've uh, just had a general question. I think uh, quite a number of them uh, related to availability of our presentations, both uh, mine and yours. Uh, so I think I think we'll be able to do that, provide that to, to whoever might be interested. We can provide uh, PDF um, files of our presentations. Uh, is, that, is that okay with you? Oh, for sure, 100%. Okay, okay, lovely. All right. Um, so just just kind of turning towards uh, some of the questions in the chat, I think we have uh, maybe a few hands up here. Um, what are the possible health and safety and environmental uh, impacts? And uh, just as I looked at that, the, the screen changed on me. Uh, yeah, what, what are the possible health, safety and environmental negative impacts of the emergence of advanced computing in the uh, mining industry? Uh, that, that's an interesting question. What are the negative impacts? What are the negative impacts of uh, of advanced computing uh, as pertaining to health and safety in in, in mining? Oh boy, negative. I thought uh, I thought it would be all positive. You know, yeah, that's the whole yeah, point of getting it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I mean, maybe I'll give myself a moment to to sort of think about what I would call a, a negative impact. Um, hey, look, but look, here's the thing. Okay, I think I think if if, if we sort of say look, but the positive side is is going to be uh, greater efficiencies more safety for the people, better for the environment, uh, you know, more energy, optimized usage of energy. Um, those are all the positive things, right? So, you know, I think any negative thing, you know, with mining would have to, first of all, you know, put people at risk. It would have to put the environment at risk and it would have to consume resources in a way that is is not right. So I, I think, look, I'm, I'm hard pressed to find anything negative. Maybe it's because, again, remember I said I was biased about mining, that I love mining. So I don't, I, I don't, see anything negative about advanced computing and, and mining if we do it right, if we do it right, right? I think, you know, like if there's some rogue element out there that is going to use information for mining in a negative way, that will be outside of our control. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah, if I if I think of the uh, one of the examples that I that I put into my presentation, you know, kind of keeping track of where the equipment is, where the people are, where the explosives are. I mean, this this is only a positive. Uh, the way I, the way I see it, the mining manager, um, he or she needs to know all that information. Uh, would would dearly love to have um, reference in real time to where these things are, so that there could be more of an efficient, you know, operational plan. Uh, put together, keeping people away from explosives, keeping the equipment engaged, and taking out the the um, uh, the minerals that that will be uh, taken on up. So I think I think it's it's all in the the intention. It's all in the algorithm. Um, it's all all the benefits are, are at at the very beginning, so that you can m ensure that you have a positive outcome. Either you know better safety, you know better revenue. Uh, you know, uh, less less greenhouse gases, less energy consumption. These these are all the basic uh, linchpins, the reasons why you would even bother to do something uh, as complex or as seemingly complex as as AI turns out to to pay off uh, uh, big time when it comes to the, these kind of basic metrics. 
Um, yeah, Tim, if I can just maybe comment on that negative um, impact again. You know, yeah. I, think, I think if I was to really stretch, like really stretch, I'll maybe point to an example of, this example, we, look, look, let's talk about Facebook, for example, right? You know how Facebook right. accused a little while back about using information in a, in a bad way? Um, now, I, I say that way, you know, because uh, when it comes to behavior analytics, for example, right? Uh, you know, could the mining industry use behavior analytics to convince people to support mining with way, way they otherwise wouldn't? Um, is that possible? I mean, possible, but it is a bit of a stretch, right? And I think that's as far as I would stretch it in terms of, you know, the negative impact of advanced computing on mining. Okay, uh, yeah, we've got some questions coming in here now. Perhaps uh, if it's okay with our uh, our operator of, of all things uh, computational, Matt, I wonder if we could go to one of the hands raised and perhaps get a question there. Uh, could we perhaps perhaps do that? Perhaps we can hear from someone more directly, uh, get them on screen as well. And not, uh, not seeing any indication. Matt, can you send me some kind of in indication? Otherwise, we can move on to another question um, in, in the chat. Uh, so let's perhaps perhaps go to um, this one, this one here. So uh, the question is, what is digitally enabled and responsive PPE? And how far along is this technology? OK, so I would answer the question this way. Um, you know, one of the things that we, we want to know is the, the, the health and condition of, of, of the, the, the boys and girls who are working in, in the underground mines. And, and there are technologies being created today, you know, where they can monitor the, the well-being of, of an individual and, and be able to use that information uh, to ensure that that person stays healthy and stays working in, in, a, in a way that is functional. You know, safety is number one. I mean, safety is, I mean, mining is all about safety. It is number one. So we want to ensure that people are safe in, in their working environments. And so there are technologies that can sort of measure the flow of, 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 of the fluid in your body, the blood, you can measure your, your, your breath, you can measure your heartbeat, and really sort of, you know, make sure that you're, you're, you're working in, in the best way possible. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but in some of these deep, deep, deep mines, people even have a work rest regime where they work for a, a, a number of minutes and they have to rest because the environment is, 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 is not very friendly right. for, for human beings to be in. Uh, so in terms of, and then another technology I'd mention is, you know, even the people's boots that they wear. You know, there's a company that that a vendor that we, we, we've been talking to who wants to use the, the, the walking process of a person to to kind of recharge. You know, the person's the, the batteries that are powering the digitally enabled uh, clothing that a person is wearing. So again, it's about making miners as smart as, as humanly possible. You know that picture of uh, the, your grandfather's grandfather in a mine with a hard head and that those coveralls that look like, you know, they have been there from the 1800s. We want to shift that, right? And uh, in, my, in my mind's eye, right? And maybe I'm just too Star trek -y, but but really that Iron Man look uh, of, of a miner of the future is really what we need to drive towards, right? So that that person is digitally connected and that person is able to even visually connected digitally so that it, when it comes to things like repairing equipment, they're digitally enabled to be able to do things like that. So that's how I look at that. So there are companies doing that already. For example, Genetech is a company here in Sudbury. Uh, they have this, a, a really smart helmet, uh, which is able to sort of give people a lot of insights on what's happening around them or around the environment. Uh, with with the emergence of electric equipment underground, it's really, really quiet equipment. Uh, and so you need those proximity sensors to be around and you need the individual, the person to be able to have something on them that sort of gives them some of those warnings when they're approaching equipment because it's so quiet. Right? You can't even hear it coming, uh, some of this equipment, uh, because they obviously don't have the same um, engine as, as, a, as a diesel engine, which is really loud. So the electric ones are really quiet. So people need to be aware of that situational awareness and just information flow and just information flow to be able to have like a heads up display where information can be presented to a person. All these things are kind of coming into play to make the people smarter. Now, take advanced computing, take all the information that the person is collecting and receiving, and then get more value out of it uh, by using advanced com computing techniques. That's sort of where we're going uh, when we talk about that, that PPE that is digitally enabled. Right, I think I think uh, the, the picture you're kind of painting, it's it's not so much your, you know, your, your grandfather, the miner, so much as your... Um, uh, your son, the uh, the uh, or daughter, the space uh, the spaceman or space person, 
you know, because when you when you get down there, you have all this protective gear. It more and more resembles a space like environment. And uh, you know, I, th I think of, you know, mining, mining on the moon or mining uh, other bodies, uh, celestial bodies. Ultimately, it will become a, a, a space trip. So uh, when you get into these inhospitable environments, especially in deep mines where it gets very hot, uh, very inhospitable, uh, you kind of begin to resemble more of a more, more of an astronaut uh, that, than a you know classic miner with with just a helmet and, and a pick, something like that. OK, uh, let's ask uh, by all means, uh, if you have uh, any more questions or if you're able to put them in the chat, by all means, uh, please do that. Now we do have a few more minutes uh, left. Uh, and again, I implore our, uh, our, our controller of the uh, of the uh, yeah, here we go. Is there any chance we could get someone with their hands up to to actually pose a question in person? If possible, uh, Matt, could you make that happen? Because uh, I don't have the facility here. In the meantime, I'll keep asking questions um, using the the meeting chat. So uh, let's talk about uh, yeah. Let's let's go to the next question. Um, uh, let's see now. Let's see now. Mo moving right along. Right. Uh, yes, yes. Just oh, a I comment here. Returning back on a previous uh, previous uh, uh, question um, that. Uh, this person had no idea that uh, miners had, uh, you know, HUD uh, capability, uh, uh, like a pilot. So that is that is very good. You know, here we have uh, the potential to educate people, uh, get them. Oh, I see someone on the screen that, that might have a question. Uh, yeah. You know, basically, inform them of of all the, the great things that are going on. It, it might be news to some people. So we have a question here from Peter Rogan. Peter, please, uh, by all means, ask your question. Thank you. So my question has to do with your uh, upcoming call for proposals. Mm -hmm. So we have most of us, uh, some of us at least, haven't had any direct interactions with your organization, and um, it's a little da daunting in the amount of time available that we're going to put in a proposal as lead applicant, uh, especially if we don't have membership. Um, can we write to you to somehow, you know, tell you what our solution is and? You can tell us whether or not there are, who would be like-minded partners who might actually be lead applicants on on a proposal. I mean, it's sort of the logistics of this process, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Peter, thank you for that question, and th that's a great question. Um, to answer your question, well, first of all, what we've done is um, the, the phase one or stage one application form that we have is honestly quite simple in terms of you know what we are asking, right? I think we're asking the right simple questions to be able to give us enough information to go on, right? So if you go on our website, you'll see that there's five questions in there. I told somebody yesterday that, you know what, you can answer these questions in your shower, okay? You're doing a shower, you can answer these questions. But certainly in terms of refining them, you can do that after the shower to make sure that, you know, the wording is right and that you're really targeting it. Um, on February 22nd, which is next week, Tuesday, um, after the, the family day, we actually are going to be hosting a presentation where we're going to be telling people a little bit more about sort of the structure of the first couple of proposals. But, uh, but I want to, to, to confirm with you, Peter, that um, yeah, you, you will not have a challenge in, in terms of completing the form. Now, if you would like to have a conversation with me uh, about that, the onboarding process to become a member and, and ask any other questions, We'll be more than welcome to have a conversation with you. Uh, you my email address will be available to you after after this. Uh, please uh, reach reach out to me, reach out to organization. We can do a bit of an interview process and bring you up to speed on on the opportunity uh, through Micah. Okay, thanks. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for the question. Um, if you have any more questions, or if there's anyone else uh, wanting to put up their hand, ask it directly. By all means, do that now. Uh, I have a question here. Um, it's a it's a very general, broad question. How do you approach the challenge of designing, implementing, and integrating so many multiple technologies? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you know what? We we, we interoperability, you know, between different. 
technologies and between different software, you know, make sure everything's talking together is a challenge. And um, uh, the, the folks over at the Global Mining Group are doing a great job, you know, in, in addressing those standards and, and, and the things that are necessary to make sure that the communication flow is, is, is there, right? Uh, I think this is just going to be a matter of, of, of an evolution of the mining industry to a point where, you know, people start to design equipment and design so software solutions that can talk to each other in, in a better way. Um, I always like to look at the sort of a factory situation where you think of an assembly line, right? On an assembly line, things sort of flow from one end of the assembly line to the other, and there's mechanisms for them to be transferred into the different equipment to perform different functions. And at the end of the day, you know, out comes a car, right? Um, but, but with mining, you know, when you look at it in the same way, um, the information that is at the finance end and the exploration side and uh, at the design and, and uh, at the permitting side, there's some discontinuity of information flow today. There's some discontinuity of information flow. And then what ends up happening is you end up with the silos, right? Now, if you look at an operation itself, like a, a mine, an operation itself, you will find that there's a lot more integration of different applications. People are building this connecting APIs to connect the different applications. But I've always said in my mind's eye that, look, at the end of the day, someone is to stand up and say, I'm the Google, I'm the Microsoft, you know, I'm the Apple, you know, I'm kind of the Uber of mining. Somebody, it's the Amazon. Somebody at the end of the day is going to need to take a position of having that sort of structured maybe application that is more widespread. Now, there's a few of them out there, okay, and I'm not going to mention any names, but there's a few of them out there who are actually making progress to establish themselves as that kind of end-to-end -end, uh, application system. Uh, but I think it'll take time for the industry to evolve to that place where we can have that more structured uh, way of information flow. Yeah, that, that sounds pretty big. Sounds like an all-encompassing uh, uh, solution to, uh, to, to everything. Uh, when, when I read this question, uh, what came to mind was, uh, you know, how do you do, you know, so many multiple technologies? Uh, one technology at a time. I mean, you don't try to eat an elephant all at once. You start with the tail and you take a little bit of the, the ears and then maybe you work uh, on the foot. Uh, you, you do have to kind of have a strategy as you approach it. Otherwise, you get overwhelmed. Uh, you make a mountain if if you just kind of look at the big picture, you you, you will not get anywhere. Pick one thing uh, is is the experience that we have at SOSIP. One thing that that is bite sized. Just get started. Uh, just convince yourself that that uh, you can derive some kind of benefit from uh, applying advanced computing. Uh, do a small project. Uh, just just a little pilot. Uh, if you get some kind of results back that uh, that begins to convince you you will probably want to do another project that might be a little more involved. Uh, and that's typically the, the path we see industry take uh, at SOSIP. I don't think it's rare that we get like, you know, them, everybody jumping in with both feet and yeah, let's do a two year project and, you know, this many million dollars. It usually doesn't happen that way, uh, especially for smaller companies. Uh, that's why we have so many repeat companies uh, coming back. They realize the value. That's why we have repeat uh, companies, uh, even even the bigger companies come back to us because they realize the value proposition we have in, in playing in our sandbox versus paying to play in their own sandbox when their own sandbox they can use to, to uh, generate revenue. Why not play in someone else's sandbox? And that's one of the features of, of SOSIP. You know, start with something small and then you slowly build up. And before you know it, you, you can have a whole program of different things going on rather than just one single one-off project so that would be my my comment to the uh, to the multiple technology thing don't uh, don't get uh, consumed by by the, the the vast jargon out there start with one thing that that affects you that you know about uh, you define the problem uh, you you uh, set the boundaries how you're going to benefit in your company and then uh, see if see if the outcome see how the outcome um, uh, benefits you and if it does and in the vast majority of cases it certainly does uh, that's why we see so much uh, so much repeat uh, business uh, at SOSIP with uh, with the companies they, they begin to realize uh, what what they have access to. If I just add to that to, to my answer yeah you know, one of the things that we've observed is that um, you know there are many 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 organizations institutions that are developing technology so I've always said technology is not really the problem right there's a lot of technology out there 
But where the challenge comes in is integrating a technology into a system, right? That is already sort of in motion, right? I've often said that um, if somebody challenged you to say, change the tire of your car while the car is moving, right? That's sort of like mining where you're implementing all these technologies into a process that is already in, 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 in motion, right? And I think the advice I would give is that, you know, for any one technology, always think about the downstream and upstream of that technology. And then answer the question is, is there a need for additional innovation to happen downstream or, or upstream, right? Because look, as much as your technology can be engaged in an advanced computing sort of uh, analysis or advanced computing uh, uh, resource uh, utilization, if the result ends up going to uh, another part of the company that's not ready to receive it, then it's kind of all for naught, right? And and we we have yeah. come across some yeah. situations where you know one technology can be the perfect domino that falls that causes a problem downstream somewhere else. Because mining is like a process, right? So you need to ensure that you know when you're trying to integrate any point solution that you're thinking it through, right? And this is why mining companies you know have these technology roadmaps, you know. And I think even some of those roadmaps need to go a step further and do that sort of impact analysis, say what is the impact of me engaging or implementing this technology into the system that is already in motion? Uh, so I think that would be helpful to think about that downstream and upstream of the technology and how it impacts the entire system moving forward. Oh, very, very interesting. Okay, um, let's see, what other questions do we have? Please uh, come forward. I think we have someone with their hand raised. Uh, Bruce Hardy, uh, we're, you're, on, you're on stream. Let's hear your question. Great, thanks, Tibor. Actually, Charles kind of answered um, part of the question in in his last statements because I also see this all the time where we've got all these individual companies going out and and creating solutions, <clears throat> but then it means a bunch of different companies knocking on the mining uh, company's door and saying, "Hey, buy my equipment. Hey, buy my solution." Charles, do you see a a, a changing trend where? Um, for interoperability and because it's such a long process that people will start collaborating on on platforms as opposed to going out there and trying to create a solution that they'll try and sell. Do you see that trend coming together? Yeah, yeah thank you, Bruce. Um, yeah, definitely I do see that trend coming together. And, and I will say, you know, mining companies um, can get a little bit tired, I guess, of those door knocking, too many people knocking on the door, right? So there are institutions like MICA, for example, like MICA, the Mining Innovation Commission is an accelerator. What we are going to play a role is in vetting, right? We're going to do a little bit of vetting and a little bit of collecting technologies into like a, a pool so that, you know, there's sort of a one place you can go to, to see many different technologies. Other organizations, like for example, like Rethink Mining, you know, they've been able to pull different industry players together and kind of work on some common problems. You know, things that are happening, for example, at NOCAT with, uh, with uh, the test mine, you know, again, pulling technologies, bringing them into a place where they can be observed and seen in one place, that's also working out. And th there's other test beds being created out there for like communications infrastructure, for things like 5G. So there is a collection of technologies coming in. One of the things I always tell technology developers is that your solution might actually never see daylight on its own. It can only see daylight if it's integrated into a, a, an existing technology. One really good example, that's not even a mining example, is when you look at, for example, the, the printing business, right? If you came up with a new print head, don't go build a new printer, okay? Find somebody who already has a printer business and t sell them your print head so that they can be incorporated into an existing printer. That's another way that mining uh, sort of innovation is to look at mining. They need to ask themselves the question is, am I gonna be a brand new solution or can I be integrated into an existing solution that needs to be modified with my technology? So there's a little bit of that happening. And I always point to the example of the iPhone, right? I say, well, okay, how many different patterns make up an iPhone, right? So same thing with mining, right? When you look at any mining solution, the question is how many different technologies or IP has come into creating that solution? So it's, it is a combination of those IPs to make things work. And I think we're gonna see a lot more of that. We are seeing some of the bigger OEMs um, really getting smart and saying, well, we're not going to reinvent the wheel, right? What we're going to do is find an SME that is ready in motion and buy them and buy the technology. So the, that whole merger, acquisition, the joint ventures, that's starting to accelerate in mining. And I think you'll see a lot more of that accelerating because some of the skill sets that are required just don't exist in some of those bigger companies and they have to get them from the outside, such as those AI skills that need to be brought from the outside. Uh, so there's a lot of more of that integration happening for sure. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Bruce. 
on on that kind of same uh, kind of subject area, um, what what do you think is the receptivity in in the, the field of mining these days for 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 a new company to come on board with some new technology? Uh, are are they going to be? Uh, what do you have to do to get through the front door? Is I, I guess what I'm asking. Yeah, great question. You know what? I think the first thing is you need to knock on the right door. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think I've found a lot of innovators come up with an idea and they approach a mining company, they, lock, they knock on the wrong door, they, actually the wrong door gets opened, they get in, and the end is not good because you, you actually never reach the, the right end, right? Now, now mining companies have gotten really smart, uh, especially the bigger companies, they've set up different or different groups within their companies and these different groups are serving that purpose of being able to to sort of be the validator of those technologies and again the emergence of, of organizations like semi and and what we're doing with mica is enabling the mining companies to to sort of you know not suffer no not 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 meet new companies that they know nothing about and and being able to meet those new companies that are somewhat validated another thing i would say is that a new company needs to demonstrate its technology in a way that is convincing to the industry, right? And and to be honest with you, the best way to convince the industry of your solution working is to try that technology in as near an environment as their operating environment is possible, right? That's why, you know what, I think what is happening at the test mine here in uh, in the Sudbury area with NOCAT is really good because it enables people to actually see a technology being tried out. I have actually had some of our clients go over to the NOCAT facility, set up their equipment in there, and be able to invite people to come take a look at at, 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 at it in 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 an operating environment so that's really really important i guess you know maybe just to end the question i would say find someone who's already in the industry who maybe you can work with you know maybe you can work as a partner because no technologies exist on an island in mining there's always someone either on your left hand or on your on your right hand who is a technology that you can marry yourself up with to move your solution forward okay wonderful and a great place to to end up our time is waning we only have a couple minutes left uh, it's my pleasure to uh, thank you, Charles, for, uh, for an engaging conversation, great presentation, uh, kind of getting us started um, off on, um, on what we hope will be a series, uh, future follow-on discussion and, and events that we plan uh, for the future, uh, perhaps talking uh, about more specific um, geographic areas, specific uh, issues, concerns. So the, there's, there is a question here that we might uh, want to pose to, to the audience uh, just before we sign off, is um, what topic would, would uh, make you come back for a second session? What would be worth uh, the next step here? Where do we go from here in this, uh, in this mining conversation that would be of most help uh, to you? So would you take a moment now and uh, just, just give us some of your ideas? We really value your feedback. Uh, because this is how we'll gauge what it is that we'll do next, uh, what it is that uh, that we'll arrange uh, that will be of value uh, to put on in our in our follow up session. Uh, but uh, but as an, an inaugural session, uh, Charles, thank you very much for for joining me today, and um, and uh, the whole community. I hope this has sparked uh, some interest. Uh, there are some uh, there is some contact information on your screen right now on who to get in touch with. Uh, this is the all important uh, point where we invite uh, interested parties for further conversation about what we've been talking about. Um, please, uh, uh, you know, approach those, those organizations that make sense to you geographically and otherwise to have that conversation um, and see if uh, th there might be some next steps where we can help each other and um, and move mining along into uh, greater innovation. So um, with that, I think I want to thank everybody once again for, for joining us. Uh, have a lovely day. We look forward to hearing from you and stay tuned as we um, organize uh, subsequent sessions. So please uh, provide us your input now before you sign off. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day.